So it's a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Daniel Snowman, who's a senior fellow at the IHR. Now, I know that Daniel doesn't want me to give him a long introduction, but I know that many of you will know his work on social, cultural and intellectual history as a writer, lecturer and broadcaster. Music, performance and opera feature very prominently in Daniel's interests, and he's going to be speaking to us today on what do you do when your theatre burns down? The destruction of the Royal Italian Opera at Covent Garden in 1856. So over to you, Daniel. I know you want to, to share your screen. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted that you're here or wherever you are. And um, as Catherine said, I'm going to talk about a particular case study in cultural, artistic, musical, operatic history, which is that the Royal Opera House Covent Garden burnt down in 1856. Any number of buildings, any number of theatres burnt down in the 19th century. There were no health and safety regulations like we have today, and most buildings were done uh, uh, of, um, built by wood and the crowds and so on. Um, which at this very, very moment while I'm speaking to you, of course, the whole opera house has closed down. But the opera house that I've known and loved for 60 odd years and is there to this day was essentially the result of a rebuild of a building that burnt down in 1856. <clears throat> now, let me see if I can get the technology right. The building burnt down, and we'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the background to it uh, in 1856, in March 1856, and a couple of years later uh, it was re rebuilt and the building that we know now, that classical revival building, dates from that time. Let me just tell you by way of a kind of intro a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. It's not just the case study. I want to talk of course a bit about opera but I want to emphasize that in anything that I've researched, written, lectured about, I've always tried to emphasize when talking about the arts and great artists and so on, you have to understand both the, the supply and the demand. I get very irritated when I read that, um, you know, Mozart took Vienna by storm. No, he didn't. Most people wouldn't have had any idea who he was. There was no photography, no recordings, no radio, no television, and so on. Um, Leonardo, you know, everybody loved it. But who would have known? There was no reproduction of the art. You can only understand the great arts and the great artists and artistic works, seeing them in the broadest historical context. When I first started reflecting on this subject, I invented for myself, and I'll now share it with you, um, a silly little acronym. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but there you go, PLESTA, P-L-E-S-T-A. In other words, if you're talking about the arts or artists, I wrote a book about Verdi some years ago, um, you have to bear in mind that P the, P, the politics, the political context of the time. And in what I'm about to talk about, we hear quite a bit about Queen Victoria, for example, and indeed Albert. L, the legalities, contracts. At the time that the Covent Garden Theatre burnt down, uh, the insurance was very, very inadequate. Um, the man in charge, whose diaries I'm going to be talking about, had to borrow money and promise interest rates and sign contracts. And he spent much of the next few years in court with people demanding what he promised he would pay them. What happens when one of your sensational prima donnas pulls out because she's ill, but she signed a contract? Do you pay her anyway? What does she? Yeah. So the whole question of the legalities, copyright, just coming in around that time. P L E, economics. Just bear in mind that what we think of as opera, the most multimedia performance art ever. It was created in the late Renaissance to try to do what they thought the ancient Greeks did, which is to have a complete multimedia art form. Drama, music, costumes, props, scenery, chorus, text, etc. And an opera, a Covent Garden on a typical evening until recently, might have 200 performers. 
Um, it could never make money. Economically, it always fell short. And one of the interesting questions about the history of opera, and indeed we'll find this again in my little talk, is who's going to pay the deficit? Was it a duke? Was it a monarch? Louis XIV or Catherine the Great? Was it something that we now have called the Arts Council, which pays a, a fraction of it all? Was it tax deductible because you're a member of the Friends or whatever? Someone had to pay the deficit. And what impact did that have on the art and the art form and the presentation? So P-L-E-S is, of course, social. And again, both the, 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 the supply and the demand both the production and the consumption. Audiences, who knew about it? Who would have gone to it? Whom would the manager of Covent Garden try to market the opera to? What did you wear? Did you have to turn up before it began? Did you have to be quiet? Could you wave to your friends? Could you go out and have a drink during the boring bits? When and why and how did it get the reputation of, as we would now say, elitist? The answer is, throughout its history, depending on how you define this silly term. But it's also the artists themselves, socially. What sort of people went into that profession? Why would they? Why would you join some peripatetic chorus in the middle of Italy somewhere before there was any, um, you know, trade unions? Couldn't even go on strike and be paid. Um, so the whole social thing. And since we're in an era where we very much look at, at um, feminist and feminine history, Opera is the only profession, I think, until really uh, 150 years ago or less, where a woman with talent, good looking, could sing well, networked well, was lucky, could become a rich international celebrity. There was no other profession in which that was possible. And yet it was possible for a woman opera singer many centuries ago. So the whole social thing, P-L-E-S-T, technological. Just think of the difference between operas when they were originally lit by candlelight, by the time we're talking about, we've moved into gas. You know, if you're wearing a sort of ballet skirt, don't get too near the footlights. Um, and gradually electricity comes in, but not till the much later 19th century. And when electricity comes in, the lights can go down, which means that audiences behave differently because they are looking much more at the stage. And then think of the technology of photography, recording, television, video, digital, etc., all of which have had an Im impact on, on, on the whole story that we're talking about. And finally, A, plus da, A, A for the art itself. The art itself has changed, tastes have changed. The period we're talking about, which is mid 19th century, the taste was for large scale, grand opera, might well have been French, uh, but translated into Italian because that showed that it had class. Italian was the language of opera. All operas were sung in Italian, um, even at Covent Garden to English speaking audiences who didn't understand it. Way back in the time Handel was writing operas, German immigrant to London, he would write them to Italian texts. So remember Plester, think more widely than simply the slight little story I'm going to tell you now, which is about the burning down of the Opera House. I'll just give you a little bit of um, background to it. The Covent Garden Piazza, I'll mostly just show you the images now, and uh, presumably you can hear me talk while the images are up on the screen. Um, the Covent Garden Piazza, originally it was part of the agricultural lands of the monastery and convent gardens uh, of Westminster. And then all the convent and the monasteries were all sort of dissolved by Henry VIII. And a century later, this area, this agricultural area, very central in London, you know, most of the bigwigs lived further in the city, further east, whereas Westminster and so on was further west. And it was just above the Thames. So you could go back and forth and stop off here very easily. The Thames was further north in those days. There was no theatre there, but after the 
I was not going to mention plagues at a time like this, but after the plague of 1665 and the fire of 1666, huge numbers of people escape from the city of London, go along the Thames, and this is the place that so many of them stop. And the whole Covent Garden piazza, very Italianized, lots of Italians visiting, very posh to have a, a, an Italianate church at one end of it. They settle here, and there is there's no theater, but in 1728, a very clever, rich um, promoter of theatre called John Rich puts on a kind of a musical, as we would now say, The Beggar's Opera, not very far away in a theatre in Lincoln's Inn. And it does supremely well. Far more people turn up for that than ever turned up or have turned up for opera. And he makes so much money that he decides he's going to put the money into building a theatre at one end the top right-hand corner, as it were, uh, the northeast corner of this very trendy piazza called Covent Garden. And here is an image from that year, 1732, when John Rich is driven in in grandeur to open his new theatre at Covent Garden. And Covent Garden, very quickly, the whole piazza becomes a market. Much of what I'm talking about, and indeed much of uh, what Charlie will be talking about, is about marketing food and drink for the people who are living around it, the grandees who've moved in from the city. Uh, you can buy wigs, you can buy a, a horse and cart, you can buy um, a bagno so that you can be taken, if you're a grandee and you've got a lot of money in your pocket, you can be taken by a beautiful woman to have a bath and whatever else is on offer. And of course, there's a great deal of what Charlie will be talking about in more detail, which is People crying out, come and buy this, buy my wares, buy this, that and the other. And you get people like Marcellus Laroon actually drawing some of the images, which again, Charlie will come back to later on. You know, I'll, cheap, I'll sweep your chimney, buy my strawberries, pots and pans I can give you and so on. And it was also an area of theatricality. I do not just mean posh theatre at John Rich's Covent Garden Theatre, street corner theatre, um, uh, Punch and Judy shows. Now, you can, if you can see the pictures now, the top left picture, the Italian puppet show, Pulcinello. You know, the whole idea comes originally from Commedia dell'arte in Italy. This was the place they all came to, both the crowds and the performers and uh, high wire artists and all the rest of it. The reality, of course, of the Covent Garden area as a market, it develops more and more into a major um, fruit and vegetable market. And the reality is it's dark, it's dangerous, there's a lot of crime. You flog whatever the hell you can and you get whatever money you can, including John Rich and his successors trying to put on, you know, posh shows, some of which were what we would call opera, many of which were not at his nearby theatre. When uh, the French artist Gustave Doy is here in the 19th century, let's move on to the 19th century, his image of Covent Garden isn't sort of grand and fun and people making a hell of a lot of money out of opera. His image is that darkness the darkness of the, 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 the market. Remember that directly over the road, over Bow Street, from the theatre was the first magistrate's court. Uh, Charles Dickens has the artful dodger tried in the magistrate's court exactly over the road from the Covent Garden Theatre. And it was disgusting, it was dirty, it was smelly. Uh, Dickens describes it very, very amusing. He says the only thing that worked in the whole courtroom was a clock way above the, where, where the um, uh, alleged criminal was being kept. The first Covent Garden Theatre, the one I've mentioned, burnt down. We're in 1808 now. And um, it wasn't managed by an arts council or a government or anything of that kind. Buildings, theatres burnt down. Um, every theatre, uh, you know, um, from sort of Barcelona, Vienna, Paris, New York, they, they, everything burnt down in the 19th century and had to be rebuilt. The fact that Covent Garden Theatre, two of them burnt down in the 19th century, is not exceptional. And when the first one burnt down in 1808, the um, people who managed it, 
uh, who, uh, in fact, um, John Philip Kemble, the, the actor, his sister there, you can see at the back there, Sarah Sins, they desperately had to go about begging for money from Lord this and Lord that. The whole area, the whole square and beyond was owned by the Dukes of Bedford, and they were sort of nice and encouraging, but they weren't going to sort of pay for a new theatre. He had to get the money, somehow or other built a new theatre, and it's the second theatre, the one that opened in 1809, that young uh, Victoria later on went to a great deal. I want you to know that Queen Victoria was an absolute opera nut. She adored it. She adored it when she was a teenager, long before, you know, she was Princess Alexandrina, long before she even became queen um, in her late teens. And when she married Albert, they adored music, they adored opera. Victoria used to draw opera singers, paint them when she was a kid. Um, and she used to try to sing along. Uh, those are two drawings by Queen Victoria when she was a teenager. The guy on the left, Luigi Lablache, you know, despite his French surname, he was Neapolitan. And he came and gave her lessons at Kensington Palace and taught the little girl a bit of Italian and sang duets with her. She adored it throughout her life. And when she was queen, uh, she and Prince Albert, who also, you know, very distinguished lover of music, they would, whenever there was a state visit, 1855, the Emperor Napoleon III of France and his wife, the Empress Eugenie, come to London on the state visit, the first thing that Victoria and Albert do is take them to Covent Garden, having arranged that there is going to be an opera on that night and uh, they go to the opera. They get there, you know, the, the lights are on permanently. Whenever they get there, the performance stops, everybody cheers and says, isn't that wonderful? And um, th that night there was an opera. And then, you know, when, the, when they've had enough, when the Queen and um, Albert and uh, the French uh, Emperor and his wife have had enough, they wave to everybody and they go back home and the performance continues for those who wish to stay there. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, a great deal of what I'm telling you about this period is based on the hardly known, non-digitized, unpublished diaries of the man who's running the Covent Garden Theatre from the mid-1840s, right through until his death in 1878. His name was Frederick Jai, G-Y-E, soft G, Frederick Jai. And he'd been in the theatre business as a young man, and his diaries are absolutely packed with all the, the initials I told you at the beginning, the, the, the political, the legal, the economic, social questions, he's going abroad a great deal. Um, if and when we're ever allowed in the Covent Garden Theatre again, as you enter the main entrance exactly opposite what was the Bow Street Magistrate Station, you'll see just to the right of the entry is this statue of Jai, as he was in the mid 19th century. And just behind him, behind his, his leg, there are a whole series of um, opera scores because he, uh, that was his business, not his art, his business. That was what he had to market. That's what he had to sell. Do not imagine that the opera house, even though by now it was called the Royal Italian Opera, only put on operas. It didn't. There wasn't an, a, a, a season around the, 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 you know, from September, October for, for 10 months with end, endless opera, or not, as it is now, opera and ballet. Um, it was a theatre. It was a garage in which different companies would park their vehicle for a period. And Jai's job, as well as setting up the annual highlight, which is a three month, maybe four month, opera festival in the spring, so sort of April, May, June, July, kind of when the season is about to begin. His job for most of his working time there was to book other companies to take over his space, pay him so that he could pay his annual rental to the Dukes of Bedford. And there might be, who knows what there might be, there might be um, a pantomime over the Christmas period, there might be events which included a bit of opera and then some gorgeous ballerina dancing a solo and then somebody coming on Paganini playing the violin or something. Then a lovely duet, then an orchestral bit, a kind of what was called a pasticcio, a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, you never quite knew what was going to be on at any given time, but whatever it was, 
he had let it to somebody or other, or he had managed it himself in the hope that real money would be made. And one of the people who took over the house, uh, not infrequently, was known professionally as the great wizard of the North. He was actually from Glasgow and he would put on sensational shock, amazing shows, which attracted large audiences. And Jai was very, very happy to let him do all that. Um, but uh, on condition that he paid serious money. Um, and when Jai went across the channel to look up and buy and contract all the sensational singers he wanted for his opera festival that was going to begin in April, he went over in, in uh, uh, end of January, 56, we're in 56 now, he uh, agreed that the Wizard of the North could take over the house and put on all sorts of shows on condition that he was very careful, put on shows that weren't too offensive, but a bit risky, a, a, a jokey thing here, a concert there, um, and occasionally a masked ball where you could all put on masks as though you were in Venice during the carnival season and you could get as drunk as you like, chat up whoever the hell you wanted, nobody would quite know, and you go home at five o'clock in the morning having had a great time and paid a fortune, which ultimately, when the Wizard of the North had had his cut, would go to Jai. Now, in March 56, Jai had been all around Europe, he'd been to Milan, he'd been to Naples, he'd been to Madrid, he'd been, he was absolutely exhausted and he'd come back to Paris where he wanted to talk to some of the people um, involved in opera performances, the Paris Opera, and sign some of them up, them up for his season that was beginning in six weeks time. He suddenly gets a telegraph, modern technology, telling him that his opera house has burnt down. This is 5th of March, 1856. He is absolutely appalled. There'd been a masked ball, and by about five in the morning, they're all drunkenly singing the national anthem. The newspapers were scathing about it. They said, you know, all these drunken people with no morals, like Sodom and Gomorrah, and like Sodom and Gomorrah, they, 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 they deserve to, to die. In fact, nobody died, but the whole roof fell in, the fire started above the roof where there were all sorts of uh, papers being kept and kind of lighting effects of a dangerous nature. And Jai is appalled. I was able, through the help of Covent Garden, I've been using his diaries, as I've said, and they let me uh, show you this one photograph of one particular page. If you look at the beginning of the second paragraph, um, uh, he hears, um, Covent Garden Theatre is on fire and the house cannot be saved. I was horror struck and so on. And he goes on to work out how the hell can I get back to London as fast as possible? I need to get hold of my Bradshaw. Maybe, maybe my people can get me to uh, Boulogne or Calais or wherever it was. And he gets back to London the next day and is absolutely appalled at this horrendous fire. He's lost everything. The building, sets, costumes, all that. His own uh, many, many uh, scores of opera. He had some Hogarths. Um, Hogarth, of course, uh, did a lot of um, his, you know, rakes progress and so on in some of the nastier places in the Covent Garden piazza. And everybody actually expresses great sympathy for him. And the, one of the first people to actually come on site to say to give condolences that very day that, that Jai was back was Queen Victoria. She was devastated. She was absolutely appalled. Now Jai has two big problems that he has to solve. The first and the most immediate is that he's contracted all these singers who are all coming across from Russia and Spain and France and Germany and some English one in order to perform a whole series of operas night after night at his theatre beginning in six weeks time and the story of whether or not he could go ahead he tried to get them to agree to slightly lower fees where would it be um, is, is something that really took a great deal of his time energy and anxiety I can't imagine he got any sleep throughout that time um, eventually uh, the decision is made as a result of a lot of um, engagement with various other theatres 
that the one simply down the road, the Lyceum, was the one where the, he managed amazingly and lost a lot of money in the process, I think, further money, uh, to get the um, first um, his season actually to run, and it was very successful. Smaller theatre, the Queen, he'd been talking to Colonel Phipps, who's her particular chief advisor, and Colonel Phipps reported back the Queen had every sympathy, and of course, whatever he did, she would give him her total support. She couldn't pay money out of royal coffers, but she supported him, and indeed, she would attend the Lyceum Theatre. Mind you, the box is rather small, maybe, she, Her Majesty would like three boxes, adjacent boxes, to be carved into one so that she and the Prince Consort and their guests could, could attend. Jai, of course, agreed to this, but he felt he's simply not going to make the money, so he arranged again by whizzing back and forth to Sydenham, where the Crystal Palace now was, as created for the 1851 exhibition that Albert had masterminded. He did a couple of mass concerts at the Crystal Palace, which helped with the finances somewhat. The larger question was how to, or whether to even, build a um, new theatre at all. And he has people like Charles Barry, the architect of the House of Parliament, saying, oh, I'm so sorry, maybe I could do something for you. What do you think? And of course, Charles Barry's Houses of Parliament, which had burnt down 30, 20 years earlier, was being built in a neo-Gothic style. This is the period of, of Gothicism. Think St. Pancras, think the law courts, think Walter Scott novels and so on. Uh, the Queen and Albert loved Gothic, they dress up all Gothic when they went to a masked ball in uh, 1842. It was a painting by Landseer. In the event, the new building, well, maybe, what about classical revival? That's also very big at the moment. National Gallery dates from a few years earlier. Very much, you know, a neo-Parthenon. Same thing with the, um, uh, the British Museum, uh, designed by Robert Smirk. So Jai and his diaries are absolutely full of all this. He's talking to architects, he's talking to the chief assistant to Queen Victoria, he's talking to bankers. He's desperately borrowing money from all the great and the good on condition that he eventually pays it back with interest and he's signed all these contracts. The Duke of Bedford says, you have my total support, good luck. And the new building is designed by Charles Barry's son, Edward Barry. And it's not a Gothic building, it is very, very much a neoclassical building. So that building opens in 1858, and it goes on uh, right through until our own times. Just a couple of words by way of conclusion. Don't just think that about opera, think about all the ads in all the programs that are themselves worth serious study, packed with telling you about where, what people dressed, where they went for restaurants, where they traveled for their holidays, still true until our own time. Do not imagine it only showed opera. Absolutely not. I mean, I mentioned earlier, in earlier history, things like Chris, uh, Christmas pantomimes. Here's one that was put on there in 1881. The building has gone on. It's, it's housed so many different kinds of shows, a lot of opera, still until our own times, until post-war only visiting companies. There was no regular opera or ballet company there until after World War II, led by Keynes. There's a photo of the building early in the last century, and you'll notice that it's basically still a market, um, and um, that's the kind of image that you get from it. The floral hall was what it was. It was a place where they simply put all the flowers, the vegetables there, which they could then flog the next day. In due course, the building has been renovated. The floral hall, of course, is still there, despite the uh, renovation uh, of 20 odd years ago. And the floral hall is now the Hamlin Hall, where you um, have your drinks uh, before the show, very cleverly designed, so that the people upstairs in the amphitheatre look as though they're sort of hanging uh, from the ceiling. And it's, I've, I've spent uh, many, 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 years of my life up in the amphitheatre watching and enjoying the show. If you look at just above the proscenium arch there, uh, more a centre of that picture slightly to the left, you'll see 
there is an image, of course, of Queen Victoria. And when you go into that house, as I hope you will, when it all opens up, when normality returns to our weird and strange life at the moment, don't forget just to, to say hi to Mr. Jai, who's right there. Let me end by saying what I said at the beginning. Opera is, it's entertainment. It has to be marketed. It's a show. It, you might think of it as being posh, clever, brilliant, great art, elitist, whatever. But Jai's job, and his diaries are packed with it, was finance, the politics, the legalities, the, all the things that I mentioned earlier on. And if the show was good as well, well, with any luck, everybody will write about it, everybody will tell everybody, and about, with any luck, they might book for the next one. So, time to bring down... Uh, the curtain on this particular subject. I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about marketing uh, in a few moments from Charlie. Time to bring down the curtain. And remember, opera is simply a form of entertainment, um, not dissimilar in a way to, I was going to say, a, a Disney movie. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you so much. And uh, for everyone else, um, we can show our um, appreciation uh, for Daniel's paper down at the bottom of the screen with the reactions button. It gives us the, the opportunity to uh, give a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much, Daniel. And I, I love the way at the beginning of your paper, you drew attention to how timely this is actually thinking about theatre and the arts in crisis, which is where we are now. And um, you're thinking about opera as business and that acronym PLESTA, I'm sure will uh, will stay with us after today. Thank you. So um, please do now um, ask questions. I can see some uh, hand up, questions arriving in the chat box. We'll get through as many as we can in the next few minutes. So we'll start with um, Lynn Walker, who raised a hand. Um, if you could speak now. Um, Thank you. Lynn, thanks. I'm here. Hi, Lynn. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> very, very interesting, of course. Um, one of my hobby horses is about not reading back onto the past our current assumptions about opera being an elite, for instance, occupation. But I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the different audiences, the sort of class background, if you will, and the expectations of the different audiences that attended Covent Garden in, say, the from the just before the period you're talking about today uh, and through that time, sort of the late 18th to the mid 19th. Opera's always been very expensive and it originated in the courts of Northern Italy or the great um, courts of some of the big major monarchs. I mentioned, um, you know, Louis XIV or Catherine the Great or Frederick the Great, um, Ludwig of Bavaria and so on. It could only attract people who were very wealthy because of the very nature of the, the, the art form. Gradually in this country, in Britain, with the industrialization and the development of, I mean, I'm using simplistic language, but a, a middle class, you begin by about the time of Jai and Victorian times to find it is beginning to attract a, a wider social cross-section. There were no, um, you, you couldn't do sort of um, uh, opinion polls or test people's age, sex, income, education, jobs, etc. in those days as, as, you, as they do now. Um, but people aspired to go to the opera and to talk about going to the opera. It was a good thing for Victoria and Albert to be, that it, that it, that it should be known that when the emperor and empress of France come, that is where they are taken. That goes on right into our times. I remember in about 1960, when President de Gaulle and his wife came on a state visit, the Queen, our present Queen, and Philip took them to Covent Garden. Um, you wouldn't do that now because the whole politics has changed. Now, if you were middle class-ish or aspirant or hoped to be noticed, you might well want to go to the opera and perhaps be seen to and maybe tell your friends that that's where you went you'd be approved of by that we're talking mid-victorian times a time of times of jai um, i found a wonderful letter in the times april 1853 just a short time before the the, the, the fire uh, there was a gentleman uh, who reported in a letter to the times that he'd been refused admission to the royal italian opera 
Covent Garden, quote, because the cut of my dress coat was not what it ought to be, according to the ideas of the doorkeeper. <laughs> he was really very shocked because he, he looked around and he thought he was better dressed than an awful lot of other people who were there and so on. Whether he went there in good time for the opening of the show and sat silently throughout it and so on, I can't imagine. I would, I would doubt it very much. Um, later in the century, just one more little quote. I mean, it's a good question because attitudes have changed. I mean, when I first went to the opera, I suppose, I can't remember, but I probably, like when I first had my first job at the BBC or the, as an academic, I probably was wearing a tie. Um, I can't remember the last time I wore a tie when I went to see an opera. I probably was wearing jeans and being comfortable, uh, but paid, you know, the, the, the price you have to pay. Max Beerbohm, sort of turn of the century writer, somebody might know his novel, Zuleika, Zuleika, that witty, one of the great wits. Uh, he used to, he said he liked to wander behind the grand tier at Covent Garden and read the illustrious names on the doors of the boxes, or he'd like to bump deliberately into an hereditary legislator who was in one of Mr. Gladstone's cabinets so as to have the honour of apologising to him. <laughs> Whether any of those people were actually watching the opera until electricity came in and they really had to shut up during the show is another question. Um, all opera around the world has recently been saying anybody can come the kids can come you can dress like you like doesn't matter if you feel like applauding do if you don't that's all right it's they've all to this day had to appeal to two different audiences the wealthy the elite those who know a little bit about it who donate mm -hmm. and the rest who might you know want to go along because someone said always oh, go and see marriage of figure it's great fun and you get very mixed audiences to nowadays. So it has changed. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. Great question. Um, I, I've been to uh, the Royal Opera at Covent Garden many times, and I do recall once going wearing trainers, and I'm now feeling much more self-conscious about that as a, as a kind of the, the cultural politics of that as a statement. <laughs> um, we have uh, another question in the chat. This is from Kelly, um, and she asks, Daniel, if you could expand a little bit on the economics of building or rebuilding. Who owns the theatre? Is it leasehold? And is the Bedford estate really the holder of it after a certain period? Did the people who loaned Jai money ever get repaid? Loads of questions around that. Can you, can you answer any of those? Yes, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying to hear Charlie. Um, no, this is a very, very good and very important question. Yes, the bed is part of the Bedford estate. There's the Bedford box overlooking the stage. And it certainly was very importantly so at the time of Jai and the fire. And Jai's first um, meeting really was with the representative of the Duke of Bedford, who said, oh, you know, his earlship, um, you know, so sorry, how terrible, how what, you know, whatever he can do to help. A bit like Queen Victoria, anything he can do to help, he'd be delighted to do, but he's not actually going to give you any money. Um, it was leasehold. Jai's job was to pay rental and to earn, to be able to pay that rental. Later on, once Jai had come around finally to the decision to try and rebuild on that site. And he had considered earlier, for example, building in Trafalgar Square, something that Charles Barry had suggested, or not having a new one at all, why go to the bother? Once he decided he would like to try and rebuild, build a new building on the site of the Bedford estate, uh, the Bedford, uh, representative said well you know his lordship is you know wishes you luck good luck i'm afraid he's going to have to put the rental up because we're now talking about the next you know and he'll lengthen it you know your, your, your leasehold at the moment is 38 years he'll make it 75 if that helps and i'll tell you what he'll he won't ask you to pay rental for the first year so all it was, he was leasing it from, from, from the Bedfords. He then had to go around trying to get lots and lots of money. There were donations, there were gifts, there were loans. And as I mentioned to you, um, some of those loans uh, were only um, given to him on condition that he would repay with interest, agreed, signed up legally. And he found he really ran into difficulties in the first few years. And the diaries actually have a huge amount about court appearances 
in, you know, 60, 61, 62, in the, in the years thereafter, he really ran into problems, um, but somehow managed to keep the, the shop going and managed to get the world's most famous singers to come and agree to a lower fee for their performances. Thank um, you, but, you know, Daniel. An interesting, complex question. The dower is a packed with detail that I won't burden with you right now. As I said, we've got some really wonderful resonances across our, our papers today. Um, so uh, Daniel has already brought to our attention some of the, the soundscapes and the sounds that we would hear outside the walls um, of the Royal Italian Opera in Covent Garden. And that's sort of where we're going now. So we're going to be thinking about other kinds of London voices um, and sounds. So I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker, Charlie Taverner, who's Economic History Society Anniversary Fellow at the IHR. Charlie's a social historian of early modern England. He completed his PhD last year at Birkbeck on the subject selling food in the streets of London circa 1600 to 1750. He's interested in how studying food can address broader questions of economic and social history. And Charlie's paper for us today is The Art of Crying, London's Hawkers and Their Sounds, circa 1600 to 1900. So Charlie, I know you also want to set up your screen share, so I'll hand over to you to do that now, okay? Yeah, hello. I should be sounding, Catherine, you want to put your thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah, great. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm going to say hello um, and thank you all for coming um, and then disappear behind my slides because I have quite a few of them um, and hopefully um, share some sound as well with you um, and that should work too. So let's try now. Okay. Um, brilliant. So I'm going to start um, with a film uh, which I hope many of you are probably familiar with. Um, this, um, and I'm not going to save a clip because I'm not sure how that's going to work, but we're going to talk through um, a particular scene. Um, in the 1968 musical film of Oliver, um, our hero wakes one morning um, in a very comfortable house belonging to his benefactor, Mr. Brownlow. And Oliver, as you can see here um, in this screenshot, is drawn to the window um, by a siren-like call of a flower seller that he can hear. And we hear her before we see her. And she's crying, who will buy my sweet red roses, two blooms for a penny? Next, Oliver here is coming from another direction. Will you buy any milk today, mistress, from several milk sellers? Their cry kind of leaping in pitch halfway through the line. And a fruit seller um, joins with her call. She's got a basket on her hip full of strawberries. She's crying, ripe, strawberries, ripe. Um, uh, you can flick through the scene. So here's your flower seller, your milk seller, and then here's your strawberry seller calling, ripe, strawberries, ripe. These three tunes overlap and intersect, and eventually they're joined by dozens of other traders um, selling all kinds of goods, and they all come together. Um, to sing in unison, who will buy, um, which is the starting point of the number that's about to begin. And I'm quite glad I'm not playing, playing it to you because it will be in your head um, for the rest of the day. The director, um, Carol Reed, and the original composer of the musical, um, Lionel Bart, really had some knowledge um, of the tradition of London cries. And by that, I mean the genre of pictures, music, and ballads that depicted street sellers and their sounds. Uh, in the film, the street sellers carry themselves and, and are dressed like specific characters um, drawn by artists like Marcel Slaroon and Francis Wheatley. I think we've seen exactly that image um, a few minutes earlier with Daniel. You can see a couple of examples on screen now, a milk seller and a strawberry seller. Those three opening cries are also similar in, in a melody and in their lyrics um, to those supposedly be captured by um, composers and ballad writers of previous centuries too. Also the way that these advertising calls, and um, which of course on the street would have been competing for listeners' attention. The way that they come together in unison also echoes another recurring theme of the cries genre, which is that in the hands of the artist or the composer, or in this case, the filmmaker, discordant, conflicting street noise is transformed into sweet sounding, harmonious music. Music that evokes a, an orderly, bountiful city, one imagined to exist, usually in the past. This blend of sentimentality and nostalgia, I think partly explains something of um, the, the long lasting appeal of, um, of, of Carol Reed's film, which won the Oscar 
um, in the year it was released. And also I think the long lasting appeal of the cries of street sellers, even at a point um, here by the second half of the 20th century, when most, most human cries, most human voices had faded from the city. Um, it's a wonderful um, movie poster um, from the time. The material and the ideas that I'm going to be talking about today uh, come from the final chapter of a book I'm writing um, with the working title Street Food, Walkers and the History of London. Uh, the book is a social economic and cultural history of the poor women and men who sold um, food in fairly small amounts on the streets. By that I mean outside the markets and shops that constituted the more, more formal economy. What the book tries to do differently um, is to consider street selling as a form of work that plays a really important role um, in, the, in London's economy, um, feeding the city in a period of rapid expansion. That is rather than um, kind of simply being a nuisance or a form of illegal retailing, um, all the last resort work of, 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 of people, kind of something like, much like begging, has often been described. The other thing the book tries to do um, is to look over a much longer period than hawking is, is traditionally considered. Um, my thesis, um, as we had an in introduction, covered the period 1600 to 1750, um, and I'm going over a much longer period. And doing this lets me think about um, street food, which is in the title, um, as something that relates to the modern resurgence of what we think of as street food, and also show that London has a very long history of irregular retail, much like cities around the world that still have a very big informal economy. It also allows us to think, taking this long view, about bigger questions of, of metropolitan history. I argue that um, the period of 1600 to 1900 is, is the high point of hawking and irregular trades like it um, in London. The work of street selling um, and its significance did not fundamentally change, despite the fact London grew dramatically from a middle income capital in 1600 of around 200,000 people to several million by the turn of the 20th century. This led us to think about deeper continuities and change within Hawking itself, but also in, in London life. I, I engage with grand narratives like, um, uh, grand narratives and processes like modernization and improvement, which we often kind of think about, which are better hard to view over the shortest span. The, the chapter on crying that this material comes from is quite different to a lot of the others that come before it. Um, it's focused on, on, on the cultural significance of hawkers and, and their sounds, and as a result, has a great reliance on classic sources of cultural history. Um, but I think it's still going to illustrate some of the major themes of metropolitan continuity and change, and also how um, hawking can be considered um, a kind of sophisticated and significant form of work. Speaking of continuities, throughout this period, Hawker's, Hawker's cries were depicted and imagined to be a source of nostalgia and to provide a kind of feeling of loss for those who, who viewed them. In the mid 19th century, uh, journalists like Henry Mayhew and his early historians of crying um, and cries, um, like Charles Hindley and Andrew Tour, were fascinated by the disappearance of particular calls, which they complained weren't as diverse um, or as numerous as they were in centuries past. Um, it's often been argued, particularly um, in the case of Paris, that nostalgia wasn't a theme of the cries until the 19th century. Um, but I'd argue that it's, it's very much there from the outset. Only the difference is the context and the circumstances of that nostalgia and what it was referring to um, was different. The genre of London cries um, as a whole emerges in the decades around 1600, a time when the capital is struggling with rising population, surging poverty, um, and recurrent outbreaks of plague uh, and famine. Vulnerable groups, as a result, like women and the poor, became the targets of prosecution um, and outrage, outrage. And early depictions of, of criers and street sellers are depicted like this, um, as you can see on the screen in large grids made up of several dozen characters. Um, these are printed on, on a single sheet. Below each figure, you can just about make out how, how their cry, what each trader is selling, um, is written down. Not only is that cry silenced in the printed form, but the hawkers have also been removed from the street environment in which they work, and they've been locked in these, these individual cells, um, and then arranged, of course, in rows according to the, the artist's plan. So kind of the hawkers of the street have been symbolically brought into line, and music of the same period does um, achieve a similar effect in its own way. When the cries were captured in, in these kind of forms, 
than at moments of unease and tension in London history, the misrule of the streets are rendered in that, what we talked about earlier, kind of sonic and visual harmony, um, like, in, like in Oliver. Another continuity over, over the time is that Hawker's calls were described as nuisances. Cries weren't just sounds, they were noise. Um, and it's well established by kind of sound scholars that noise, um, and we think about that term, that is a cultural construct. It's what a particular society um, or a community is deemed to be unacceptable or without particular use. Um, if cries were frequently called noisy, the significance of that charge, however, did change um, over the centuries. The early criticism in the 17th century focused on particular social groups, those we were talking about a minute ago. Women, women selling food were thought to make high-pitched, harsh sounds, such as brabbling and rattling. Those are the words that we use um, to describe them. In the 18th century, um, we get a, a developing kind of clear division between the coarse music of the street and polite, educated musical culture associated with the burgeoning metropolitan middle class. Articles in Spectator and St. James Chronicle, elite newspapers, proposed ways of tuning Hawker's cries, making them kind of sound much better. These, these, um, these complaints have their visual analog in, in, in the painting, um, in the engraving you can see on the screen here, which is Hogarth's Enraged Musician, um, in which street musicians and hawkers disrupt the practice of the violinist. It's a picture that's been called by Sean Sedgreen the noisiest picture um, in English art, and you can see all the performance going on. By the Victorian period, particularly the late, um, second half of the 19th century, sound is increasingly understood um, as a waveform and hearing as a mechanical function. So we've got a new kind of conceptualization of, of sound. So Hawker's cries were believed to, like all the other kind of roaring sounds of the city, physically affect the body. And the letters pages of newspapers um, are littered with complaints about calling Hawker, um, Hawker's kind of shouting on the street, breaking up the quiet, that professionals needed to concentrate or ruining the quiet of a Sunday morning. Between 1600 and 1900, or, or certainly for much of that period, Hawker's calls, though they were often decried as a nuisance, they still had a clear function um, within the urban soundscape. Sound theorists um, often talk about the idea of an acoustic community, a community that's united by the sound um, that in, its inhabitants heard and significant um, which they assigned to those sounds. For this community, certain noises and sounds such as church bells and the click clubbing of hooves, the raising and closing of shutters, these all conveyed meaningful information. And in London, cries were one of these sounds and they were chiefly important, I think, for communicating the passage of time because cries come and go in daily, weekly and seasonal cycles. They took on meaning through their repetition and their rhythm. Um, this is something that's, that's kind of captured um, repeatedly in writings um, of the period. I think an important starting point for it is John Gay's Trivia, um, a poem that is presented as a guide for would-be pedestrians in the 18th century city. And the narrator suggests that walkers don't need a calendar or clock to tell the time or the month, but they can use their ears to listen out for calls. They can hear new season vegetables fried out in spring, mackerel being cried, from June onwards, walnuts, plums and pears in the autumn, and rosemary and bays near Christmas. Successive cries the seasons change declare. This becomes something of a literary and artistic trope, the idea that you can hear the seasons um, in the sound of the city, it's repeated time and again. But we find it um, but we find evidence that Londoners may have been listening for these temporal um, cycles. Um, in other kinds of material. So even in those letters, um, the newspapers in the late 19th century, uh, which were complaining about the noise, um, we kind of get a little bit of this indication. So for example, this resident of West Brompton in 1876 wrote, every morning as surely as the sun rises, and I woke up at six o'clock by the melancholy shriek of the milkman. And it's during the remainder of the day, one is regaled at intervals by the fruiterers, the flower seller, and the fishmonger. And then on Sunday afternoon, the quiet district is turned into a perfect pandemonium by the sellers of fruit and flowers. The point is, you can be annoyed by sound, but you can still pick up lots of information for it. It's still a part of the soundscape. Hawker's cries um, were a feature of the metropolitan soundscape, 
uh, much trouble to the Southgate we stayed again like Hawking in many ways very similar um, at a basic level um, from the start of London's expansion around 1600 um, through uh, to around the mid to late 19th century though we started to see at this point the major changes the city becoming much louder and the introduction of of course new technology um, like things like the railway and, and the motor car. I said at the outset I'm particularly interested in Hawking as work um, and I'm going to turn towards that for the rest of the time I've got. Um, Hawking is not simply a um, it's not simply kind of a cultural phenomenon, something that was kind of consumed in, in artistic forms, but it was an important part of their labor. Um, crying itself, shouting out was work. Um, it's a bodily practice. And as the image that I kind of used in the, in the um, flyer for the seminar, and I've kind of repeated here, is a small kind of detail of Paul Sandy's um, depiction of the Max Seller from the mid 18th century. And I'm always really struck every time I see it, particularly in comparison to other works of its genre, um, of the kind of the shape of the hawker's face, which is certainly something kind of animalistic that he's trying to suggest. Um, it's there in the word crying after all, but I think we also understand something of the strain on her body. Hawking is hard work. You have to spend several hours a day calling out you'll be exhausted. And we get some testimony in the 19th century um, about the um, kind of the effort that it requires. Um, for example, some of the interviewees um, in Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor um, talk about having husky or broken voices. And we know that other hawkers use alternatives, um, like the famous muffin bell, um, some use drums, and others hired young boys to shout for them. Part of this was, it wasn't aimless effort. Um, crying was a skill. It's an advertising technique at heart. Um, it's, a, it's a street trader's tool that's been underappreciated, I think perhaps because of the, kind of the, the main kind of dominant narrative of the rise um, of the shopkeeper and the ongoing importance of the permanent market school. Though we can't hear how hawkers use their voices um, in the past, we can make careful use of songs and music from the time that did claim to capture something of their call. Um, an example here, um, here are some excerpts from a mid 18th century ballad um, called The Cries of London. After a brief introduction, every line um, of each verse is devoted the hawker's call and to a different hawker's call and they kind of total perhaps more than a hundred in the whole piece. Um, on listening and if you go to the uh, uh, English Broadside Ballads Archive um, database and have a listen it's quite a bewildering and intense effect as if you're walking down the middle of a, of a hectic market. But there are patterns to, to the way that hawkers are supposed to cry out um, in the song. The lines tend to start come by, here, will you buy or do you want? or they list a price or quantity, and you can see two bunch, um, two pence a bunch, young carrots, ho, there. Other cries list the qualities of the food, you know, the cherries are round and very sound, um, or we get, we get a sense of the provenance, um, where the food comes from. Salmon is from Newcastle. The patterns that we see in the ballad, I think are, are very suggestive of how hawkers had to stuff huge amounts of information um, into a few words and into this sudden burst of sound. And though the exact form of their words undoubtedly changed um, over time, the basic technique of that um, stayed very similar. In other examples of the cry genre, um, we can go beyond um, just thinking about the words to think about rhythm and pitch. Ballads are less useful here because um, for both to know them, they're typically sung to existing tunes. And so we have to think about and rely on instead um, other musical pieces that supposedly reproduce calls. I've got on the next couple of slides um, extracted examples um, from a number of different pieces um, and writings on music. And these include compositions for voices and strings from the early 17th century, um, and also some rounds, um, some rounds for multiple voices um, by William Savage um, in the 18th century. Across these very different um, and multiple forms, um, I think we can, we can see kind of cries apparently following a number of particular shapes and possessing particular characteristics. So the most common form um, across all these pieces of music, I'm hoping the sound will work, is the descending cry. So 
Now, hopefully I'll get a message from someone if that hasn't worked. I'll play it again. So that's a cry from Mackerel. You can't hear the words, of course, um, from Richard Deering's The Sippy Cries. The other common form is the V-shape that um, descends and then returns to its original note, um, either gradually or sharply. The example I've got here is a codling's cry from Gibbons's Cries of London. Another, another aspect of the crying seems to be a rhythmic style, mixing up notes of long and short um, duration, um, which is a way of catching the ear and providing um, some colour. Um, so, for example, here is a sprat cry, again from Deering, uh, Richard Deering's The City Cry. I'll play it one more time. So um, along with these styles, some hawkers may possibly have developed um, kind of more distinctive um, individual tunes, um, which may have become uh, their own signature or the signature of particular commodities. Um, this seems particularly the case with the watercress um, cry, and here's uh, an example from William uh, from Around by William Savage from the 18th century. again. And I hope you get a sense of kind of the brightness and the jollity of the cry. Um, of course, when we're listening to music in this way, um, we're only scratching the surface um, of the way street cries would of course have sounded on the streets um, of the city. There are, there are many, many aspects that are very, very hard to capture on, on the stage. Um, at work, street, and street vendors, of course, would have been less worried about tunefulness and more concerned with manipulating their voice um, to get their point across. So, um, and we can see this captured in some particular ways. William Gardner, in his 1832 book, The Music of Nature, described how criers picked a particular word for emphasis, or they used sudden leap in pitch. Um, and he, he transcribed one milk cry, so he said, I cry for milk, um, in which he uses the grace note um, to suggest a jump on this nonsense kind of shout of Mew, um, which I'll play now. You can see that leap on the word Mew. Incidentally, that's a very similar leap to what we get um, in Who Will Buy um, from Oliver with the second cry, the milk seller, when she appears on the scene. Um, vendors would also have varied their tone and um, varied inflection. They'd have mixed cries, possibly with gestures, um, and broken up their calls with patter and conversation, and perhaps jokes. Um, there are other factors too when we're thinking about sound, such as um, how the, the gender of the cry may affect timbre, and also accent, of course, many hawkers not being English-born, especially in the 19th century. It's also very important to consider um, historical sound um, in a way that these are while we're listening to these cries as kind of isolated musical kind of snippets, in, in that, at that time they would have been heard within the street environment. Their sound would have been very much affected by the material um, and the form of the street um, and buildings on either side of them, the intensity of the traffic, um, and also things like the changing weather. Of course, there are all sorts of interpretive problems with these kinds of sources. Um, overwhelmingly, the cries, music, and, and the ballads just like the visual prints were produced and consumed by people wealthier and socially superior to those that are being depicted. The other issue we have um, is that they're part of a genre. Um, many, of the, um, many of the examples um, use strikingly similar language um, and, and, and even tunes to earlier versions and they seem to be referencing each other. It's also a European genre so the references in some cases are international. However, I'm quite sympathetic towards those scholars who have argued there's something right from the start of an ethnographic intention, at least partly in these musical and visual depictions of street workers. I think therefore that we basically shouldn't set our bar too high. 
We can't aim to hear exactly how these cries would have sounded, but we can point out the principles hawkers may have followed and techniques they might have employed while calling as they went about their work, as they were trying to sell food, attracted attention um, to people that were passing by or in houses. I think we can say with, some, with a fair degree of certainty that hawkers advertising calls for brief rhythmic tunes repeated with small variations. And um, finally, I think the other reason we can make this claim with some confidence um, is that this is still the case um, elsewhere in the world today. Um, I've taken an example of Mexico City here, where a city that is still famous for having street workers and traders who still use their voices, along with other kinds of instruments to alert citizens to their presence. There are differences in the way um, hawkers we know calling in Mexico City um, shout out to the way that we might understand they did in London. For example, we can't know if London, haw London hawkers use the same nasal tone, and of course they're crying predominantly in a different language. Um, but the basic principles, um, I think, share very much. Hawkers' calls in Mexico City tend to be brief, and they employ rhythm and repetition as a way of rising above the hubbub. We also see similarities um, in the effort uh, required. Um, one scrap metal collector um, became particularly tired of calling and recorded his daughter making the cry instead. And this has been played on a loudspeaker and copied countless times and becomes the signature sound of the scrap metal collector um, right across Mexico and beyond. Um, the cries um, in Mexico today similarly have a cultural power that goes far beyond um, the work of these um, itinerants on the street, echoing how the cries of London have continued to be part of the capital's culture and, and, and also London myth well after Hawking's heyday um, between the 17th and 19th centuries. Um, as, a, as a real closing point, in the um, 2016 presidential election, uh, presidential election, for example, Donald Trump was at, in a rally in, in Ohio and he was doing his, his classic bit um, railing against um, uh, illegal immigrants from Mexico planning his um, big and beautiful wall when protesters interrupted his speech. They got a loudspeaker and blasted the cries, um, recorded cries of the Mexico City, um, Mexico City scrap metal collector and a vendor of tamales from Oaxaca. Um, and again, I won't play you the video, but I think the audio alone tells something of the story. We'll call up Carrier, the president. I guess I have to do it myself. I know it's not. Okay, and on that um, note of resistance, I will stop and we can have a bit of a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you for a fascinating uh, presentation and uh, yes, sharing some of the sounds with us um, as well as your, your insights and your research. So again, we can uh, show our appreciation for Charlie, with that reactions button at the bottom of the screen. So I like the way we're now thinking about the whole city as a sort of space of performance um, and spectatorship um, you know, beyond beyond the theatre that we started with. Um, so please do feel free to ask a question for Charlie now. We do have to finish promptly at three o'clock, but there's time for at least a, a couple of questions. You can type into the chat box or you can raise your hand um, in the participants panel. And I've got a question I'd like to ask actually, um, Charlie, which kind of, it, it sort of um, thinks a bit, a bit beyond what you were talking to us about today, which is that I think, um, you know, this uh, the, the, the sort of the the real um, growth of interest in in aural history and in soundscapes is something really exciting at the moment. And I'm aware of some really interesting um, digital projects that sort of recreate some of those soundscapes, like the virtual St Paul's Cross project or the work that Mariana mm -hmm. Lopez at York did on the soundscapes of the York Mystery Plays. I wondered whether you had any interest or any plans in recreating some of these soundscapes, either as a as an immersive tool for for thinking about the early modern city, or as a as, as something that could be kind of overlaid with a sort of augmented reality um, addition, you know, to, to to being in in the city of London today. Is that something you've thought about? Um. I've, I've kind of thought about it in a kind of dreamy moment um, several times because there are, as you say, there are some really wonderful projects. Um, there's also this uh, 
I don't know if you mentioned it just then, but the the sound uh, the sound streets of Paris um, sound as a kind of VR um, kind of walk through the city, kind of a fly through the streets with some some elements of sound um, put in. Um, yeah, I know. I know. There's. <laughs> I. I mean. I. I know there's a fair amount of kind of controversy sometimes among uh, sound scholars about the idea of recreation, um, and it can be quite divisive, particularly because there's this division between sounding and hearing being two different things, and like hearing being particularly, you know, culturally conditioned and dependent on particular circumstances. So how we can hear that kind of soundscape is very different. But I, I kind of do tend to fall down as my fairly empiricist examples um, from there and um, from that presentation suggest towards the sound that we can think about the way these sounds were created and I think that's quite useful and, and, and quite quite helpful and then at the other end we may not be going to hear exactly the same way but we can also um, think about the way that that hearing was thought about in a much more kind of rich sensory history kind of way. Um, I've, what I, the thing is this is a there's things I would love to do around kind of uh, recreation around it but uh, so the this is a, a I don't really call myself a historian of sound in some way I talk about sound in this way I'm right fundamentally interested in kind of Hawking as like I say as work mm -hmm. um and sound is part of it I think it's that this is a good area for like collaboration certainly yeah, there's a lot definitely. that I can like not do kind of myself but if other people are interested in particular sounds that can be weaved together and worked on as part of a soundscape I'm quite interested Great, it sounds like a, a great potential collaborative project. We've got a few questions coming in on the chat. So the first one is um, from Nikki, and uh, she asks, how do you think the cries integrated with their spoken patter and their approach to selling and marketing? So they integrate very nicely in Oliver, don't they, very tunefully. How do you think that works in reality? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it, it's, uh, it's one of those important things about considering the, the things like cries in their context, going back to what Daniel kind of was talking about, and that these are um, calls that would have been sounded out in a market setting, in a street setting, from a store, and you're not, and, and as a result, they're not kind of continuous pieces of music. Um, they're kind of short things that are kind of repeated kind of time and again. And I think there's an analog probably in that way with, and the, I don't know, there are various obvious parallels with ballad singing and things like ballad singing and things like that. And when people are advertising, you may sing your snippet of the ballad in the form of advertisement, but then you're also going to be describing the price. You're going to be, um, you know, saying where it's going to come from, suggesting what the tune is. So there's various other bits of information that you might be passing on. I think the um, representations of crying that we've got do suggest are very suggestive of the fact that this is music um but it, it it's slightly different and of course it's going to be mixed up with kind of conversation um cries are a kind of in between sound anyway they're not quite music they're not quite speech they're not quite a raw shout they, they exist in this slightly um mixed zone and i think that in functionally they operate um in a kind of uh kind of collage as well Brilliant. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, we have another question. This is from Sarah. Um, I love this question. She says, were street hawkers active and tolerated in polite London? If so, were nicer products like flowers more, accept more acceptable than something like stinky mackerel? Uh, did hawkers use the streets or the pavements? So a few different questions there. Okay. Um, just in terms of like neighbourhoods, I think um, there's often been an assumption, um, particularly for the early modern period, around um, people like street vendors being uh, for people that serve the poor predominantly. Um, but what we know about um, their customers is actually much broader. Um, and we can think about that in the ways, the, the different ways that they're selling. Um, so some will have been um, working out as kind of semi-permanent stalls on the street side. Some will have had wheelbarrows that they'll be on the go. Others will have been with baskets. Others would have gone on rounds and kind of worked door to door as well. Um, and it's clear that some were working through kind of a variety um, of neighbourhoods um, right from the outset. And you can find instances of street selling in, in places that are um, kind of wealthy and places that are very poor, um, I think, throughout, throughout the period. And, and in fact, 
um, a lot of the complaints that you get in the late 19th century about street shouting and crying um, do tend to come from um, people living in Lycia, um, uh, Lycia kind of suburbs or, um, or in the kind of grander development um, almost exclusively. And that's kind of what you'd expect partly because you say, well, these people are expecting some kind of quiet and some order in their particular neighbourhoods. But the very, the very fact that um, itinerants were working there suggests something. I think the fact that there was clearly business. Um, and of course, they would have been dealing as well with the servants of those households. Um, it's not just a case of they're going to be doing um, uh, kind of face to face trade with the um, social elites themselves. Um, and on the pavement, was it pavement or highway? Um, yeah. Uh, I would say it, it tends to be that. Um, but I would say both. <laughs> um, they're going to use the pavements themselves. I think stopping on a pavement can be quite difficult and you're more likely to be moved on as, as an obstruction and we have kind of lots of instances of that. But the danger then of being more towards the highway is that you're kind of exposing yourself to risks of um, being kind of knocked down um, or uh, yeah, being knocked down by kind of traffic of different kinds, kind of either human or animal or vehicle. Um, so they do exist kind of between the two. I mean, and also you're raising the question then of the, like I mentioned at the top around improvement and like how far and that and how um, comprehensive that process is across London. And it's certainly true that for a very long time, those kind of grand plans for improvement are not true right across the city. And then the fact that those kind of well kind of segregated pavements don't exist in many parts of London and the kind of paved streets are not as kind of perfectly smooth. Um, as lots of the 18th century reformers um, would have suggested. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, there's, there's one more question that I'd really like to take because it's a really interesting one. Um, so let's have to be super quick because we're almost up against the end of our, mm -hmm. of our session here. This is a question from Rosa. Um, thanks you for your paper. And um, this is inspired by the, the current moment that we're in. She asks, given that hawkers rely on being out on the streets to get their customers, do you have any information about what happened to them during plagues? Were they seen as carriers of disease? So just, just quickly for us, uh, uh, Charlie, do you, do you see concerns about that in the sources? Um, it's not something I've come across on a, kind of, on a very kind of specific plague level. There's certainly a connection um, in a like, uh, like medical history understandings of urban health way in the 17th history that hawkers are one of the obstructions that block the free circulation of both traffic and also air the streets of um, the city. Um, there, I've been asked about this as well by people working on plagues before, and it's a very good, very good specific question. Um, and the other thing to consider, of course, is that there would, with various people kind of moving out of the city, perhaps kind of business would also have fallen. But the other thing is that with people, people traffic, pedestrian traffic, um, reducing people going to the market less often in a plague year that is going to potentially um, affect the, the access of people to food and then kind of itinerant vendors may have a kind of uh, more important role. But it's not something that's very prominent in the records um, in London. I think. That's really interesting. That thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. And thank you for those fascinating questions. Um, I think given that the, the IHR Zoom is being used for another event at three o'clock, I think now is the time actually where we need to begin to, to wrap up today's seminar. Um, First of all, I hope you'll all join me in thanking both of our speakers again for their wonderful papers. Again, you can use your reactions button or you can clap in the more traditional way if you would prefer as well. Um, terrific papers, both of them, and wonderful to, 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 uh, to start thinking about all the interconnections between them and new ways of thinking about sounds and, and, and performance and performativity within the city. Thank you to everyone who's joined us, people who've asked questions, everyone who's supported our speakers um, here today. Um, we hope to see you at another online IHR event soon, uh, so do come and join us again.